Hey, what's up, Shot Makers? It's Rob here. I'm here with Coach Hernando Planels. And hey, Coach, go ahead and tell the people about yourself, man. Well, I'm currently a slam ball coach. You know, slam ball, full contact basketball on trampolines. We're here in Vegas. But I've been coaching for, I can't believe I can say like for 25 years now. <laughs> that just means I'm getting old, right? So I was a, a grade school coach, a high school coach. A junior college coach. I coached overseas in the pro leagues in Japan, Philippines. I was a New Zealand national team coach. And then I went to the women's side and I was a associate head coach at Duke for seven or eight years. And I was at University oh, wow. of Illinois, head coach at William Jessup, which is NAI school in Sacramento. And I mean, I wasn't a very good player, you know, high school, sat on the bench, junior college. In high school, I played a little. Junior college, definitely <laughs> sat on the bench. With basketball, I also, and because of slam ball, I do basketball choreography on film and TV. So movies like Coach Carter, Longest Yard, yeah. I do all the choreography. I train the actors, uh, work with a company called Game Changing Films. who I've known them for over 20 years as well, too. So I kind of have just been very hard-headed with my basketball career <laughs> and just wanted to be in places where I'm still involved with the sport. But really, at the end of the day, it's all about coaching and how yeah. to help people get to just another level. And that's what I really have fallen in love with. And now I also do leadership workshops with organizations and communities all around the country as well too. So it's just taking all the experiences and the joy that I love doing coaching and then slam ball, basketball, yeah. corporations, all of that, all of that. That's pretty dope, man. Off camera, we talked about extending careers <laughs> and how many careers there are within basketball, how your basketball skills can translate into coaching and I see you've taken it even into corporate coaching yeah um so I want to talk about that a little bit man because that's <laughs> something a lot of people don't understand the pathways right what got you into that into the corporate coaching side well I, you know I think that we all need coaching right where we are in life is of our doing yeah. so in order to break generational curses in order to get out of our own way mm -hmm. we need people who see things that we don't see Right. And that's yeah. the only way to improve in anything. And most people, I'm sure that we all have a friend who just have blinders on. They don't yeah. understand what's going on in their life. So you need people. But that means you need vulnerability. You need openness, et cetera. So with all my coaching and I've been very blessed to have coached at some really great places, because to be honest, no one's going to hire Hernando to be a corporate speaker. But Hernando, who used to be a Duke and slam ball, et cetera, yeah. people start hiring you. So. That means you have to, if you want to get into corporate speaking, you have to increase your own value, whether it's through social media, whether it's writing, whether it's websites, whatever it is, you have to grow from there. And I just been really blessed. I do a whole marketing campaign. I reach out to companies. It's a job. It's not yeah. like people are calling <laughs> me on the phone like, hey, Hernando, you want to come speak? No, 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 it's not the way it works. You got to go out there and get it. And I always talk about it, it's being aggressively patient, right? Most players, most people just sit around and wait for something to happen. And they're like, well, I'm being patient. This is happening. No, no, no. You got to be aggressive in everything, yeah. relentlessly aggressive so you can go out and get what you want. So coach, aggressively patient. <laughs> yeah. Slam ball. I told you we had Brendan on mm -hmm. from, from the mob. I was telling him, I knew a couple guys from my area that played the Campbell brothers. Yeah. Uh, Scott Campbell. Yeah, Scott, Scott and Chris. Scott and Chris. Yeah, so I, I used to play ball with them back in the day at College Park. So, slam ball, man. You guys came, and mm -hmm. I remember you guys had the momentum, and then it was like you guys were gone, and now right. you're back. And I think it's no better time, man. Can you explain the feeling of being back and where you guys see slam ball going? Well, it's crazy to be back, to be honest. Like I tell the story all the time. Slam ball is like the girl you haven't spoken to in 20 years. And yeah. then she calls you and be like, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> hey, you want to hang out? Yeah, let's hang out. I mean, it's kind of like that because, you know, when slam ball first came out 20 years and I was blessed to be with Brendan as one of the original coaches, of the sport, you see it growing and growing. And then, it, like you said, it got cut right away. I mean, there's this big debate, is it sports or entertainment? It's both, yeah. right? Every sport is entertainment. 
And a sport really is a competition between two teams or two individuals, right? That's exactly what the definition of sport is. So, you know, for it to be back, it's amazing. And to be asked back is there are no words because you you feel like that phase of your life is gone and now it's back and you have this new generation of players even on my team i'm coaching jamal barnes jr who i coached his dad in season three my assistant coach is sandy fletcher who played football and basketball at usc there are nine coaches in slam ball right now who all played for me and not like a pat on the back for me but it's more like when you see these young men at the time grow yeah. And now they have kids, they have families, they're coaching. Mm-hmm. For me, coaching is no longer about wins and losses. It's the impact you make on people, no matter big or small. And that is what I'm really, really loving about this new generation of slam ball. That's awesome, man. It was entertaining then. It's <laughs> just as entertaining now. Yeah. And I'm really glad you guys are back, man. I think the climate is built for it, especially right now with social mm-hmm. media and the streaming and the way that we digest sports right now. I think it's perfect. So Slam Ball's back. You were at Duke. Like you said, man, when you dropped that on your resume, instantly people were like, hey, man, let's go back. Let's talk yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah. So <laughs> we can't let the Duke slide by, man. So how did that happen? And what was that experience like? Because, you know, that's one of the most hated programs oh, in yeah. sports, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I, so I grew up in L.A. Okay. And uh, coaching at Duke or North Carolina for that whole state, you, you don't even imagine. You just can't imagine it. And so... I coached in Japan in the pro league and I was so bad I got fired, which then led me to go to IMG Academy where they were training camp for slam ball season three. Okay. And we did slam ball season three and I was married at the time and I was like, we're moving. And I was also a part-time scout for the NBA for Marty Blake and it sounds glamorous, but it really wasn't. They pay you for like 10, 12 games, but really it's to get a press pass and talk to scouts, et cetera. So I said, we're going to move to North Carolina. So moved to North Carolina, worked at a school, ended up getting a job in the NBA G League with the main Red Claws, now the main Celtics. And then I met a couple people at Duke and I started working the men's camp at Duke. Met Kevin Cullen, the video coordinator at the time. He's now a big time video guy in the NBA. So I, I talked to him. He said, hey, get old Chris Spatola. And Spatola was the director of basketball operations. They put me on the camp staff and I'm working Duke men's camp, which is amazing. And then while I'm there, I end up meeting someone who also works the Duke women's camp, and they had an opening. So then I slid into that camp as well, too. So now I'm working men's and women's camp, meeting people, et cetera. That was it for the first year. Then I went to go coach in the Philippines. Next year, I did the exact same thing. And Coach Joanne P. McCauley, who was my boss at Duke, saw me, and I was selling her book, and just full of energy all the time. I don't know where I'm going with my basketball career. I'm so close to just giving it up. And she saw me, and she says, hey, I've got a great low-paying, non-coaching job on my staff if you're interested. I was 35. I'd never finished my degree. But I said, yeah, sure, I'm interested. So then they call me and say, hey, did you finish college? I was like, no, I haven't finished. Like, well, we can't offer you the job. I said, okay, fine. Hung up the phone, thought about it, called them back and said, hey, how much time will you give me to finish? I said, I really only have two classes. They said, you got six weeks. So I finished a a statistics class and a speech class. And six weeks later, I got a job at Duke making $28,000 for the year. And with a wife and two kids and a house, you can't do that. So for six months, I ended up working that job. I worked for Synergy Sports, editing games. And I started my own company called Resumes for Coaches, where I design resumes for coaches. And six months go by, I'm struggling, man. I'm sleeping like three hours a night. And then someone leaves staff. And that was like on a Friday. And I was going to put a whole presentation on why I should be the assistant coach. She calls me the next day, which it was Saturday. I was at the drive through line at Taco Bell because that's all I could afford. I remember because I was ordering wow. a seven-layer burrito. And uh, she calls me and she says, hey, everybody calls me H. H, I'm going to move you up to assistant coach. My, my mouth dropped. It was a great pay raise. And I was there for seven years. 12 WNBA players recruited and coached, developed ACC championships, Elite Eight. It was just a great time with it. And even to this day, it's still kind of hard to believe that I coached at Duke. And I remember being at practice. I'm staring at all the banners and my boss is like, hey, H, pay attention. Like you hear, because you're just there. And I got to sit in on Coach K's practices, met all those guys, met everybody at Duke. And for someone who never really finished college traditionally, was never a big time player at all, to be there, to meet the people, at first it was a little intimidating. And then after a while, you just get in your groove. And we had a great run while I was there. And it's an amazing experience that I was able to have for seven years. That is awesome, man. So I'm going to put my tech founder podcast host hat on real quick, man. You kind of talked about something 
that a lot of people experience going into new environments, new horizons. Would you say that you kind of went through imposter syndrome? To be honest, I think I, I live in imposter syndrome all the time. And I look at it a different take. I don't think there's anything wrong with imposter syndrome. And yeah. one of the reasons why is because since I, I now work in TV production, anytime you go into a room, anytime you do something, you have to become something else. Beyonce becomes Sasha Fierce when she's on stage. And so I think you have to believe who you want to be. Now, the problem with that is that most people believe it so much that they don't believe they make mistakes. They believe now they become untouchable. Yeah. But if you can be true yourself and realize that you can be who you know anybody you want when you enter in a room that's a pretty good thing everywhere i go no one believed i coach at duke i work camp one year my camp at duke one of the coaches was there and i always introduce myself as hernando i don't like introducing myself as coach hernando coach planel i'm hernando i'm h giving tour to all the camp counselors and she stops me and says, hey H, so what do you do here at Duke? I'm like, well, I'm the associate head of women's basketball coach. And she's like, <laughs> man, why don't you say in the beginning? I said, I, cause I don't need to. Yeah. So I think it's the power that you have. And I think most people become somebody when they're around their friends or anything mm -hmm. else. But you gotta be like that all the time. If you yeah. wanna be great, then you have to act great. You have to be in circles that put you to be great. I grew up in LA. I don't have a lot of childhood friends. I keep up with them on Facebook. But you got to break your circle in order for you to keep on moving forward. So I know I went off on a tangent there. No, no, man. We love it, man. <laughs> I think there's nothing wrong with it until you start believing your own shit. When you start oh, yeah. believing that, yeah. then it becomes a little like crazy craziness. And that's why you always have to be where you are. Like, it's good to look down at your feet. Where am I? I mean, I tell my players all the time, like, look where you are. Yeah. Be here. We have one game winning streaks. You woke up. God could have said, hey, today's the day that it's over. No. Yeah. You have unfinished business. So that's how I look at it in anything that, that I've done. No doubt, man. I'm in the same line of thought, man. Some people call it imposter syndrome. I like to call it being aware of the moment, mm. right? Being aware of, like you said, the shoes that you just stepped into, mm -hmm. taking it in, realizing like, man, I'm right here in Duke. I'm right here in Slam Ball. Again, we're back. Taking that in, man. So we're all about challenges and you've shown how you've overcome challenges and how you've been able to be present. Now you got a phone call about the job. Yeah. But before the phone call, you were preparing a presentation. Yeah. To show them why you deserved it. Right. Not knowing how much they already knew you did. Yeah. I love it, man. I just hope the players and people that <laughs> actually watch this, man, I hope they soak that in and they can use it in their life. But before we let you go, H, you got to create a challenge for the Shot Makers League people and hopefully for some of the <laughs> Slam Ball fans as well. So did you, did you think about what, you, what category you want to do it in? Yeah, and, 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 I, and I want it to be under random. Let's um, go. Let's go. So the challenge I'm going to pose to everybody, um, and it, it may be a little odd and it may be something you, you don't feel as comfortable, but every morning and evening when you brush your teeth, and I hope you all brush your teeth, <laughs> but when you do that, I want you to look in the mirror and just say three words. Like, I love me. We struggle so much with authentically loving ourselves. And as a coach, I've been through divorce. I've been through not being around my kids for years, questioning myself over and over again. And I find that athletes, anybody in general, forget that part of loving themselves. Now, not, not in an inauthentic way or a crazy way, but I want you to count how many times. Can you do it 30 days in a row? Can you do it 45 days in a row? What are you doing to strengthen your mind when you grow through trials and tribulations of life that is given to you so that you can be stronger? So I know it's crazy. I know it's not like making shots or anything, but <laughs> how many times, I'm gonna challenge everybody. How many times can you say, I love me morning and night? Let's go. Coach, we appreciate you coming on Shot Makers League, man. We appreciate you imparting your wisdom. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. Man.